So the biggest thing for me that I needed to do was get to the ball. Like I had great court vision, high IQ, and a really good arm. But there was very little lift to my game. Like I couldn't jump compared to yeah. what okay, you would so see. So you're athletic. You just didn't have the highest vertical. Yeah. I'm coordinated, okay. just not a big jumper. So a three-step in that scenario would just allow my first step to get to the direction. And then my last two just had to gather as much as it could to get me to like what I needed to do. Is Mark Burrick. And here at Better at Beach, we do everything to help you get, guess what? Better at Beach. We have seven day training camps that are awesome vacations. We have one day clinics. We have coaching clinics and coaching certifications. We also have a plethora of online courses and online coaching where you can get coached by current NCAA coaches, professional AVP coaches, national team coaches, just by uploading your film to our private Facebook group. We actually give you feedback on your game, your practices, your skills, as well as uh, nutrition and fitness advice. So if you ever want to jump on board with that, you're more than welcome to visit betteratbeach.com. And we are currently, if you're watching this live, this is in the middle of June right now, 2022. Uh, we are releasing our camp dates for fall of 2022 uh, and the winter there. So if you're not on our email list, make sure you get on it because those camps sell out quick and don't want you to miss it. They're going to be in Florida this year. All right. On today's show, she was a member of the 2013 SEC first year academic honor roll where she earned her bachelor's degree and master's degree from the Louisiana State University. She was named all SEC following her junior season and finished her impressive career with more than 1,000 digs and kills. She was a four-year starter for indoor volleyball and beach volleyball for one of the most powerful programs in the entire country. Unbelievable. And she helped lead the Tigers to back-to-back -to -back NCAA championships in 2013 and 2014 she has helped build the lsu program from the ground up as a player and now as a coach and her 73 victories uh, stand as the fourth most in the young history of the program in her first season as an assistant coach with the lsu beach volleyball program katie leak who is our guest today, helped lead the Tigers to a program record 31 victories and a third place finish at the NCAA championship. Without further ado, Katie Leak, welcome to the show. Congratulations on all your success. Thank you. Happy That's to be here. <laughs> pretty awesome to, we talked a little bit off camera about what it was like to play beach and indoor at the same time time you know it's such a rarity even in high school now to find what we used to call three sport athletes where you'd play three different seasons and here okay there's there's argument to be made like volleyball is the same sport it's truly not but a lot of the skills carry over and you are a two sport athlete at a super prestigious and competitive university so what was the best part <laughs> of playing indoor and beach at the same time and what was the most difficult part sure i think the best part was i mean you get to be a part of two teams two like that want to compete want to be great and it's hard not to have that year round and feel that i guess anticipation excitement of game day for a whole year straight um that's rare when you get into college so for to be able to do that most of the year was really fun the hardest part was probably not having an off season to get stronger that was something that definitely took its toll. And by my senior year of um, both, it was hard to feel strong to make it through like a full season of all the load. But looking back, if I were to go back, I'd do it all again and would know how to handle it probably better and better. But if it's available, what would you, what would you change? My nutrition, that total, like I huh. really try not to live with regrets. I think everything can be a learning opportunity and something to take like into the next situation. but. If I would have really utilized the resources around me to figure out how to fuel my body, I think my health and just overall approach to the game and longevity of a season would have 
been a lot better. <laughs> Were there any like specific eating habits that you're either embracing now or telling your players now? Like it's hard, you know, there's so much advice out there, especially yeah. from, I guess what I used to look at as like old people sure. people now currently like my age, like 36, like you're old, you know, <laughs> and they had all the advice for like eating and everything like that. But I would just stuff my face at Chow Hall. I was pretty lucky in that I actually enjoy vegetables and fruits. So I would dump like yeah. a big plate of salad and then a big plate of everything else. But it's not easy for everybody to like know those choices and, and exactly how to fuel. I remember having like a Snickers and a Red Bull before yeah. a practice when I was gassed just because I was like, I know that some form of sugar is going to kickstart me. So I'm going to do it. It's better than not having anything. And then the caffeine, yes, that increases performance, but I'm sure I could have done better. So what yeah. could you have done better, like specifically? And what do you tell your players? Yeah, great question. Specifically, I could have gone a little bit easier on the French fries. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty fun joke, but I was an emotional eater for a very long time. Just, I would like ride the waves. If I had a really high high, I'd want to celebrate with dessert. If I had a really low low, I would like be able to consume probably a larger amount of food than I needed to, or just the nutritional value of what I was eating wasn't very good during those mm -hmm. emotional spells. And I really think as I'm externally processing that experience and kind of going back, being in season kind of has highs and lows. And so I just naturally like rode the wave instead of learn how to, I think I should have eaten a lot, like just because we're competing a lot, you're training a lot. I never believe in restricting food just because of how much I know that athletes like expend on, on energy, but learning how to like maybe eat more proteins versus chips <laughs> or desserts, like just really learning what actually is going to fuel my body and give me the energy that I need to perform. And I think a lot of times that's what I encourage our athletes with, because you see specifically in beach volleyball or just any sport that does have probably tighter clothing or less clothing, like there's a lot of poor body image that we never mm -hmm. want. I never encourage or never want any player to ever experience in a negative way. Everybody's built different. I think everybody has different needs when it comes to their fueling for their bodies, but it's never going to be from a restrictive place or how you look on the external like factor of life. It's more like, what does your body need and how much does it need to be able to perform at its highest level? And that's something that typically is starting to become more important in the college mm -hmm. scene. And, and I think just in general for athletes and universities are starting to really buy into performance nutritionists, just mental health in general, like that might cause different triggers that could involve eating habits or eating disorders. And I didn't expect it to take this turn, but I think it's something that is important for athletes to like experience and acknowledge and really figure out what their body needs to fuel the best. And it doesn't have to be restricting or like getting skinny. It can be, no, I actually might need to eat more, just more healthy or options. Right. Like what macros, you know, you're taking yeah. in like the proteins versus the fats versus the carbohydrates and then what types of carbohydrates and, and when For really, sure. I mean, like you could eat uh, terrifically and that, that'll benefit you over the long term, but the timing of your eating yeah. could also just, you know, it's not going to wreck it. You're still putting good fuel into it, but you'll feel sluggish if you have too big of a meal, you yeah. know, like an hour before your match, because then you'll hit like that downside of blood sugar. You'd be like, I'm exhausted and I ate right. So what's the point of eating right? Yeah. You know, it's like, well, you kind of ate right. I suppose somebody might have mentioned eating well in college for us. Sure. But there wasn't like, so we have now, now that I'm creating our own programs with Better Beach, right? We've got nutrition challenge and it's a mm -hmm. it comes with a 21 day fitness challenge and then we have our 60 day max vertical for it's a workout program but we give one nutritional challenge per week so it's like this week you're going to drink a gallon of water yeah every day you know that's your mm -hmm. like one challenge and then this week you're going to cut out one thing one thing that you know is not serving you at the highest level in terms of your diet. Like just yeah. one item, you know, and for old Katie, it might've been like, hmm, all right, let's get rid of French fries uh, this week. But we never had challenges like that. Like any way to guide us into 
can you give me something actionable, usable that I can start making some building blocks into a good diet? We never had any of that. And I think more mm -hmm. coaches and more programs could probably be served by doing the challenges the way that, that we do them now with our company is like, Hey, let's just build one thing at a time. See how it makes you feel. Yeah, for sure. An all or nothing mentality can be scary for that piece. I know I have that tendency to be all in or all out and there's no in between. And I think too, for athletes, just learning about who they are and their personalities can even like help them trust that they can figure it out and that they can do it. I mean, it's okay to actually go there and figure it out for yourself and take the time to do it. It's yeah. going to be really helpful. You're right. It's when people <laughs> look at like a dietary change, they think about an overhaul. And as soon yeah. as they think an overhaul, they think I'm not going to be able to accomplish it. You know, it's too high of a mountain to climb. And so yep. calm down. Let's just, we're going to start here. How much water did you have today? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Tomorrow we're going to have one more glass of water. Like, yeah, let's start there. And so that's why some of the people are really like enjoying our programs. We just give them bite-sized stuff to be able to build. And I think more collegiate programs or coaches could have just that, you know, there's so much concern with playing, recruiting, paperwork, accounting, and keeping up with all the NCAA rules that it's like, what's diet slides sometimes and nutrition slides as far as being a coach and then the team you don't know that might be causing all of your losses sure. <laughs> like sure. if you don't eat the right time or over time maybe it's causing injury who knows yeah for sure anyway i didn't expect to go to a nutrition talk but <laughs> interesting Surprise. to know that like that was the one thing that uh that you'd like go back and change if if you could and maybe that could have given you more longevity more wins more strength what do you think yeah i think longevity is the accumulation over time and being a hitter indoor you're taking a ton of jumps a ton of swings and then in the off season if you weren't playing another sport you would be able to actually build the strength back to go again for another year and so on top of not maybe eating at the right time or eating too much at a time and not enough here, my energy and capacity to actually have the fuel I needed was probably what caused longevity and really wins at the end of the day. <laughs> I think the accumulation of kind of everything, who knows if we would have won more or lost, like not lost as much or whatever that would have been. I think a lot of factors play into that, but right. on an individual scale, longevity to help the team probably be as good as it would have been the answer. When you were making the switch every year between indoor and beach and let's let's go both ways from beach to indoor and indoor to beach okay what were the absolute changes that you had to battle mm. between that little transition like what did you tell yourself i guess you had to probably go through a few cycles but but what did you tell yourself your junior senior year early when you had to mm. make the switch to the sport like make sure you change this because we're playing this now yeah good question for beach like coming out of an indoor season into beach i knew passing would be different i mean indoor you're passing to one specific location so your platform angle like how you get to the ball what your movements that you make and the angle that your platform is going to be at is always going to go to one specific spot mm -hmm. for like success but beach and being with two people like your platform and the location of your pass isn't going to be in one spot at all times. And so that was one thing that over the years got easier to just transition into. And then also hitting like on an offensive scale, there's a lot more power that goes on indoor that you have to make sure you have, whereas beach, you kind of have to be able to have control and power to be successful. And where you start your approach and when you start your approach is completely different from indoor to beach because indoor doesn't have wind and it doesn't have the elements yeah. and the surface and the depth of the sand changes for beach. So for beach, like going from indoor to beach, it was always passing like and hitting like timing, okay. I guess would be the best way to simplify it. And then can we unpack that just like a little bit where when you're going to beach now, where does LSU teach to pass? Because mm -hmm. indoor, you're passing to the front right of the court, right? Between the middle and the front right of the court, right? Yeah. So that's kind of, and you're always getting it probably three to five feet from the net. Sure. Yeah. 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 Is that accurate? Is that where you guys are? Are you a program that passes on top of the net or do you leave the ball 10 feet from the net in indoor? Like what numbers were you guys given? For 
not recruiting purposes. There's like NCAA rules that I'll, like don't allow me to specifically talk about LSU. I probably should have said that before we went live, and I apologize. Okay. That's okay. like a big – I apologize. But generically, I can say generically, mm -hmm. broad scale. Where, where should great indoor players pass? Front right, not front right. That's kind of funny. Uh, front right <laughs> of the court, like not on top of the right side, not on top of the middle hitters, mm -hmm. but kind of in between that zoo kind of area. Okay. It's typically where you'd want to pass and generically where you end up trying to pass from age eight to the rest <laughs> of your life. <laughs> and typically for beach, you're wanting to get that ball up in front, definitely in front of the middle of the court is what anybody that I've talked to would be a good mm -hmm. area. And you don't want to be on opposite sides of the side that you're actually passing from. So if I'm on the left side and I'm passing to the right of the court, that's probably going to be tip like harder to be consistent offensively mm -hmm. every single time. And then if you're on the right side of the court and you're passing to the left side of the court, most of the time it's hard just to get where we need to be to put ourselves in position to approach. Right. Back in the day, I like this passing location has changed for mm -hmm. so many coaches. And from when, when I came, because when I was learning, it was pass straight in front of you. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years into the game, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Why would I like make my, my setter run an extra distance? And now I have to work harder to get into a hitting lane. Mm. And so, so then I started moving my pass more to the middle. And what we teach, sure. I'm allowed to, what we teach at Better at Beach is one o'clock off of your inside leg. So like okay. if you're standing on a clock and straight in front of you is 12 o'clock, we always pass to our one o'clock if we're a left side and to 11 o'clock if we're a right side, essentially like a 30 degree angle, sure. right? And for us, the way we teach it, it's that angle will stay no matter where you pass from. So if I pass this from the sideline, I'm not going to try to tug it all the way back to the middle. Sure. If I pass from my middle, now I'm going to leave it actually on the opposite side of the court because I still keep that 30 degree angle. Sure. But why... Was the straightforward pass like a simplification? Maybe. I feel like it's, and this is just in my experiences, like mm -hmm. I feel like if, you, if we take that route, if that's like the teaching point, if we're going straight in front of us, I feel like that's a pretty, and you can accomplish it and you're consistent enough to actually like attain that. I'm passing straight in front of me every single time. Then my setter knows exactly where I'm going to be and knows mm -hmm. exactly where to go. So it's less okay. like it's, more pressure on the passer or consistency. There's more trust. There's more like just straight line. Like we can go right where we need to go and then we can create from there versus different types of system. I mean, any place is going to has the potential to teach so many different things, but For sure. that's, yeah. I would think the benefit or maybe why that was in the beginning or why that could be a teaching strategy. Okay. As a player, do you pass, further off of the net in beach than you do in indoor or are you like no mm -hmm. same location both sports i would say it's different more on top of the net for indoor and maybe less on top of the net for beach but mm. i'm not above i'm pretty low forward pass <laughs> most of the time that's my favorite skills passing like mm. i love creating the angle that I need and was really confident in being like, get to the net, like release. Like I'm going to put it where you need it. Just get there. And then we'll go from there. So it was kind of fun for me. As a player, did you have a, cause we're talking about your history and those transitions. Did you have a different height that you passed at for either sport or was your height always what it was no matter what sport? I would say for beach, it was lower height and that's more so for wind purposes and indoor, it was probably high to the antenna, like with a little bit of arc. Wow. Like, I didn't want to pass too high. That's it? Um, like? Like, maybe maybe a little bit higher. Like, it's not going to be a line drive, but it's going to, yeah. like, it's not going to be super high. We want to, like, kind of push the tempo for mm -hmm. our setter to, to be where they need to be. And if the setter's back row versus front row, like, in the zone, like, kind of depends personally, mm -hmm. like, on if I were to be served – and depending on what rotation I was in and where our setter was coming from would probably determine the height of my pass, if that makes any sense. So like yeah. if my setter's in zone one behind the right back passer, I'm not going to like bullet it to her because I want to give her time to get to her spot and then be able to have the footwork to create from there. But if she's already in zone two, depending on her rotation, I'm pulled back to pass. 
and I'm on the right side of the court, then I might lead her a little bit more than just like set her up on top and maybe give her a little more time so that it comes into her window and she can still see the blocker. Um, oh, okay. So if you're passing sense. from the right side, you focus on creating like a little more arc because she's yeah. coming kind of from behind her. And then if I'm on the left side and she, depending on where she's from and the time it's going to take her to get to her point mm -hmm. of like setting and dishing, then it would depend on like kind of where I put it. That was my favorite part is just kind of figuring out what the team needs, what the players need. And if mm -hmm. I could do it, then that would be really fun to create for them. I was told, you know, growing up, like pass low, pass low, pass low. And a lot of people like low set. And then they accused height of wanting a higher set. Well, I don't want to set that high. I'm not 6'3". I'm not 6'6". And the more I watched film, <laughs> you know, and like every FIVB and AVP match, I'm like, there's not a single pass that isn't getting six feet above the top of the antenna. And sure. people, I, I just pass at the top of the antenna or I keep the ball under the top of the antenna. I go, do you know what really happens if you try that? You know, there's, you can run the spread offense or like a little bit shooty, but keeping a ball under the antenna in normal conditions when it's not windy that's personally i think it's brutal and i think people think it is because I, I just played a tournament with dave palm who actually just won in yeah Muske Mus in muskegon yeah yep. and i go through this with every one of my partners i say all right how high is your perfect set and yeah, yeah he's like top of the antenna top of the antenna and i set him top of the antenna and he like barely got to it and then I set him about four balls above the top antenna. He's like, yeah, that's it. And I'm just like, so it's not even close to top of the antenna. <laughs> like, it's just what you yeah. imagine, right? You're like, no, let's, let, let's give this visual. But in actuality, the game, I think, is played much higher than yeah. lower levels verbally say. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, putting a camera on the side of the court makes a huge difference. For sure, for sure. <laughs> okay, so you're passing changes because it's not a fixed location now you have a a floating location or is or do you guys always pass to middle i would say floating kind of depending on where you're yeah. served and also depends on the experience level of the person that you're playing with or yourself how so like if, i mean we see a lot more in this game indoor players transferring to beach they're like last years or even freshmen coming in to a program so kind of you got to learn how to be controlled first before you can actually start to play with like the location of where you're ending up. Does that make sense? So like typically it'll be floating. They're not going to aim for straight middle. If we get past to the serve to the outside of the court, we're not going to try to yank it back inside. So that might float a little more towards the sideline ending up, not on the sideline, obviously, but, and if we get served middle, we're not going to try to like bring it right back to where we started from in our passing zone. So, and if kids can control that, then that's fun to be able to maybe like start to strategize on like where we want to end up passing. But if they can't, then typically we're just low forward. Oh, so <laughs> if you get a more advanced player, then you kind of set up a different passing location based on what you want to do. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. It could. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of just depends on what the capability of the player is. And that's not necessarily something we like. And I, I can't be specific, so sure. I just have to kind of generically give ideas. Okay, okay. <laughs> to an yeah. Idea. Oh. Huh. okay. And then when you were telling yourself for hitting, what was the advice that you that you put in your head for hitting? Because you said you needed, you know, more shots during the beach. I'm actually kind of surprised that people change so much when they go to the beach, like compared to indoor. I think if more people held on to the mentality of, I'm going to hit, you know, I'm going to hit this ball with, with power instead of it's beach. It's an entirely different game. So now I need shots. Yeah. You need shots at some point, but if you were terminating against six people <laughs> and two or three blocks, why aren't you terminating here on the beach? You know, so yeah. what, did you, what did you tell yourself going into, I guess, between indoor and beach? Like what was the difference that, that you gave yourself? Yeah, my goal was to be able to at any point in time, unless it's just a gnarly out of system situation where at that point I'm probably free balling it over anyway. Mm. But for in system and partly out of system setting, I wanted to be able to have a, an aggressive swing on the ball, a great high line, and a great cut shot. 
at all times, no matter where I'm at on the court. And so I feel like there's got to be some level of consistency and looking the same for every single approach that I took to be able mm -hmm. to create all of those shots that I would need. So if they pull, the blocker pulls, then I can just get it on them or like go middle or even like create the cut shot while they're so deep and won't, wouldn't expect it. So I think just having more consistency in how I looked and then my contact point to be able to like over time have the reps to really see where on the court I could create all those swings um, mm -hmm. or shots. Whereas indoor, depending on where the pass ends up would depend on where my approach becomes and starting point is or where I'm transitioning to or out of, but it's basically still creating a ton of power from that place. But as the years went on, I got to create like a gnarly cut shot on the indoor. So like if I was out of system or I was in system and the block, like was the game plan was to be double blocked or whatever the defense would give, Beach really allowed my control to just get gnarly. And so a lot of the time I knew when I could create pace. And then if the off blocker decided to like go in for the tip, then I could just like hit the cut and like off speed. Mm but because I was still approaching aggressively like I would in the beach game right. and in indoor to know that I actually have a ton of availability with my shots on top of the power that I had. So do you think beach gave you that bailout and you might not have discovered that if you had consistently played indoor? Yes, 100%. Hmm. It started to get really fun. And I think even that even played into a factor on a positive note, like whereas nutrition might have been negative to the game or negative yeah. to like doing both, like control and being able to place the ball wherever, whenever, however, was something that actually was the positive from getting to play both. And then in the beach, like indoor allowed me to stay aggressive in the beach game more than anything and like allowed me to continue to get aggressive approaching reps, aggressive swinging reps even though I might not have been able to spend time in the off season to like work mm -hmm. on that for the beach. Was there anything negative that beach brought to your indoor game that you're like, mm, I have to get myself out of doing that because it's a habit that was developed from beach. I don't know if it was necessarily a habit. Uh, okay. I got one habit and then I got okay. one. Like, I guess <laughs> the habit was probably passing because my location changed to like the habit of like fighting for different techniques just kind of like was weird of like going to mm -hmm. one location at all times, even the height of the pass, the distance of the court. I mean, the court's bigger indoors. So it was just a different distance in my platform and using my lower body to get the ball where it needed to end up for indoor to beach. So uh, yeah, you, you need to almost no lower body with beach, right? When that ball's moving so soft, it's like, mm -hmm. all right, well now I have to nudge it eight feet. <laughs> You know, it's like a free ball and indoor. You have to kind of chuck that thing. Yeah. To, yeah. to get it up there. The ball doesn't bounce as well. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So that's like what comes to mind. But then the pace of the game, like, was an adjustment in the summertime when I'd go back into indoor. Because I think beach can produce a ton of pace and a ton of power, especially nowadays. Like, the beach game has grown so much. And I think it's always been there, but not as – frequently and not as many people like would be able to produce the power like you can see now but indoors fast and it's heavy and it's quick and a, a lot of moving parts to where you had kind of beach it's a little slower like movements because it's only two of you and you're covering the whole court whereas now there's six moving parts and the ball's getting on you like that so huh. defense blocking like anything really i would say and the ball's different right so yeah. it's a little more yeah. slick indoor. So there's different factors that definitely have probably a two week period of adjustment. But when you do both for that many years and you've kind of grown up playing indoor, it wasn't as hard as it probably felt at times. <laughs> two weeks. I always give my, I give, I have the two week rule. If I'm doing something new, I got to give it two weeks and like I can adjust whether that's a workout coming back for, spring like whatever it may be a two-week rule you got to give it two weeks to adjust and then you can start to see like kind of how you actually feel about a certain i thing. love that patience to be able <laughs> to say like i don't need to fix it today 
yeah I, I have two weeks to fix it and I, i'm like for me i'm going through it right now i'm just coming off of a broken foot so i Ooh. haven't touched a ball in eight weeks you know and i was in great shape with great touch uh took yeah. a third in the avp in florida and even then i wasn't feeling like i was anywhere near my max but the first all of last week i was just like get me as many touches as i can possibly get because my nervous system yeah. will come back you know my body will remember but I have to get as many touches as possible. And yeah. I knew that it would be ugly <laughs> and it really was, it really was all last week. And now today I finally felt like, hmm. ah, my body remembers how to get my feet set up. You know, I, I can set the ball with control and my legs are solid and I'm still really not waiting on my approach, but I'm piece by piece figuring it out. And I'm like, at least accepting like, Hey, there's time. <laughs> yeah. I can wait here, but just keep doing the reps and trusting the reps. I feel like Kobe do, did that. Yeah. You know, where he's just like, no, you do the reps because we're going to shoot a thousand three pointers and your body's going to learn how to get it in if you keep yeah. doing it with decent yeah. technique. And your worth isn't in the sport. Like, hmm. you're not doing like the, the broken foot thing can really like force you to face yourself and kind of like, check where you're putting your worth in and i'm saying this because i gotta face it myself so i'm not sinner saying i have it figured out but your worth isn't in what you're doing you're doing it because it's something you're passionate about and something that brings you fulfillment and i think you can do that at practice after you're healing from a broken foot like the results of what you're trying to get to are fun to try to go after but you're not doing it because that defines your worth you're doing it because it's something that brings you fulfillment and that's to be celebrated. So for you who has a broken foot or coming out of that, that sucks and that's hard and that's real life, but it's kind of cool to see you get back on the horse and really thrive because you enjoy it. <laughs> Not because yeah. it defines you. You know, I, I feel like I'm luckier than most because I knew that when I got hurt in college, I was way more depressed than like this injury. Like once I had my broken foot, I'm like, believe me, it was brutal on the psyche and yeah. the mental, but I have so many other things to work at now consciously. Like I want to work on my relationship with my wife every single day, you know, like how can I be there for her? I have this stuff, my team sending you a message that yeah. system was created only because I had the time to work on a system because I was hurt. So I couldn't like be physically wow. training. So the podcast got strengthened during that time. Our website got strengthened during that time. But I had other stuff to focus on and improve where I had like multiple goals. Some people who are so fully invested in a sport, especially I think a lot of D1 athletes, mm -hmm. it's tough for them to then say, where can I improve now? Yeah. You know, and, and where can I find worth? Because you, you associate that worth with like your teammates. You know, you're like, you're doing things for them. You're, you're helping them. You're leading a team or guiding a team or being a part of it. It's not only like that volleyball is your worth, but yeah, the view of your peers and, and what you can do for them. Yeah. I just think it's so hard for people who are fully committed to a sport when they get hurt. It is a brutal few weeks there. Yep. Do you have any advice for when your players get any injuries and you're trying to keep them from going over the deep end in terms of like depression and, and mentality yeah. is there any initial focus point that you give them yeah it's the big thing was, is worth like i'm very passionate about that and starting like to encourage them like i mm -hmm. initially start with encouragement and never like this is why or this can no just i'm encourage them to like really look in the mirror and address like what they think about themselves now that their sport isn't available to them every single day. And for me, and I can't speak for like our players, but I can speak for myself who went through that. Like I really learned my identity and really learned that it was solidified in like Christ. And I know that that's not for everybody and they're like, they're everybody's faith journey looks different. But for me, like learning that there is a God who created me and mm -hmm. has made me for specific plans and for a specific purpose and to be able to have something outside of what I could do, give me acceptance, no matter what happens or no matter what occurs. Um, and that there was somebody who was willing to kind of pay the price for my shortcomings so that I could live a life of joy, fulfillment, peace, patience, kindness, like really 
got real in that time of injury. Mm. And so I think that it can be used as a blessing, even though it like forces you to kind of admit that it's not and admit that (laughs) it sucks and admit that I'm hurt. Like I ask them to go to a place they don't want to go and admit like what's actually what they actually think about themselves, about the sport, about where they stand, where their confidence lies, about what they doubt, what they believe, like Mm. whatever that is, I want to be available at that point to love them exactly where they're at and show them that they're more than what we ask them to do and prove that in my encouragement, in my availability, in including them, whatever we can include them in like on a daily basis. That's can, huge. Yeah. Not not letting them feel like they've been excised from the community just because they're hurt. That's where depression occurs, right? It's like when you're alone and you don't think that anyone understands or anyone cares or that you can even reach out and contact them. Yeah. So I think for those injured players, bringing them and keeping them around the team and giving them responsibilities. You know, we had a, a great coach who, at least when I got hurt, I was like, what can I do for the team? What can I do yeah. for the team? Yep. And he was like, I need somebody to take stats. Honestly, I've always need somebody to take stats because he's one guy. And I was like, fine, done. But then I found two games into taking stats. I was like, I was holding this clipboard and I was like, Fred, I think my team needs my voice right now. Mm -hmm. They need me to fire them up and like punch them in the chest and to get them going. And he's like, you're the captain. You make the choice. And so I like (laughs) threw the clipboard aside. (laughs) It's like stupid stats. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I just started like raging on the sideline and, and getting the energy up. And that brought my value back. Like I had to find yeah. my value. And sometimes you search for it so and from. you miss, you know, you don't get it. You might miss three, four, five times, but you just got to keep shooting. Yeah. Mm. And at that point, they kind of realize like they don't have to earn anything. They're already a part of it. They're already a part of something. And so to be able to kind of be a tangible representation of in a weird way, like faith of like, yeah. it, it didn't take you earning your way earning this swing, earning this pass. You didn't have to earn that to be a part of who we are and be a part of this group and be a part of something bigger than yourself. And injury kind of allows you to kind of see if you can take that or not. But the value piece, like you said, was really good and something to always encourage. Cool. Well, let's shift gears away from injuries for a second. Was there anything that you learned? Because you you said you were in so many sports growing up. So as a multi-sport athlete growing up, and then you're from Arkansas, is that right? Alabama, close. Alabama, apologies, Alabama. Were there habits or things that you learned to play the game in high school or as a kid, as a junior, that once you got to university at a new level had to be erased? You know, Mm -hmm. sort of like a, a warning or a common thing that so many coaches or so many players are being taught or teaching that you're like, oh, that's not actually how we do it at the top level. Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> I kind of want to say no, because you had great I coaches. Think, <laughs> yeah, I was blessed to have Rose Majors Powell as my club coach, and she was a part of an Olympic team back in the 80s. So I had an Olympian as a club coach. And I think that when you get to the collegiate level and professional level, there's different systems and different ways to succeed. So I was like taught how to pass one way. And then I got to college and it was a different passing technique. And then there were different assistant coaches that came in and came out of my time at LSU. And so we What were those differences? For passing specific, and I love passing. So that's why I'm like, I land on passing. So I think it starts yeah. off every like day. What were you taught pre-college and, and during college that was so different? Yeah. Fighting to like kind of be midline was the technique of like mm-hmm. a lot of footwork like on the front end to like create what we needed to get it to zone two or a three pass is what is coming Mm -hmm. to mind for me. And then there's some years where it's like a lot of angles with our platform, like getting our platform out early and creating that angle and then kind of flowing through the pass and different ways to address a short ball versus like taking a deep ball. Like there's just different techniques that I had always been taught or opening how to open up correctly versus like one, like, There's one where you can take whatever foot needs to get to the ball the quickest, like an immediate like drop step directly back versus like opening up, like Mm. hips open versus stepping back. Like I've just kind of experienced different types of technique in that way. And then a three step versus a four step approach. Like I've learned both and I struggled. Yeah. Let's say attempted. What did you learn Um, pre-college? Three step approach. You learned three step? 
Oh yeah. Just... And I have not been able to figure out a four step for me. Like, wow. And I'm not going to bring in dancing because that would take a whole nother like turn, but there's like little rhythm to my body. And so going from like three step all my life to attempting four step, like the rhythm and the timing, like really got in my head and I lacked a lot of confidence and was scared of failure at the time that it was introduced to, right. to actually use it to my advantage. And some of our teammates did, some of them didn't. So, okay. Those are examples. I'm, I'm still shocked that a three-step is used like almost anywhere. When I look at all pro and national teams, yeah, I'm like, how is a three-step still existing in some places? But then as a coach, I still know, hey, you have to figure out what works in a short amount of time for a player. And if you have a title on the line or if you have something on the line and it's just, it's not clicking for that individual or for you as a coach or you as a program, then you, you have to figure out what works for you. I just see every single national team, yeah. beach and indoor, all on a four-step. So that's why that's why we push it. You know, it's like, well, yep. listen, if we're going to do it one way, we're going to do it the way that all of the best players in the world are doing. And it's always a little bit surprising when I still hear that a three-step like exists in places. So like, do you have any rationale or can you present the, this is Sorry. why we do a three-step? You know, this is why someone would prefer it or why you should do it. I lack athleticism compared to like most. Like, I'm a division one volleyball player, two sports, multi-sport growing up, and I lack athleticism. First like of all, BS. Second of all, go on. <laughs> I'm not a big jumper. So the biggest thing for me that I needed to do was get to the ball. Like okay. I had great court vision, like high IQ and a really good arm but there was very little lift to my game. <laughs> like I couldn't jump, like really compared to yeah. what okay, you would so see. So you're athletic. You just didn't have the highest vertical. Yeah. I'm coordinated, okay. just not a big jumper. That was always something that I wish I have talked to God about many times of like, why couldn't that just be a part of my design? So a three step in that scenario would just allow my first step to get to the direction. And then my last two just had to gather as much as it could to get me to like what I needed to do. And obviously I tried to jump as high as I could and be as athletic as I could, but like adding another step almost like could create just more steps in the process of just getting to the ball. Okay. So you thought you, in defense of the three step, you think that it's a potentially more accurate way to get yourself to the ball, not necessarily the, the highest jump, but it, it's possible that you can have some better feet to ball. If you're a little bit more patient, you have less momentum yes. going into it. So you don't have to like break your momentum and then readjust. Yes. I can see that because we still, even with the four step, you still like, okay, your second step, your left step should still be directional. Yes. You know, that's yeah. what's getting you to the ball and you have to have control over how you step off of it because from your left you could go left forward right or backwards yeah and if you already have momentum gained into that that becomes a little bit more difficult i think yeah all right cool four step versus three step I haven't had that discussion in a while <laughs> yeah. i don't know if you ever will <laughs> moving forward no we definitely will there definitely will okay so <laughs> you made this immediate transition from player to coach right yes what was the most difficult part for you of being a player and then now you have to coach your peers yeah like the person that you were just battling with now you're kind of in charge of them it can't be easy yeah it definitely took its toll like being up until this past season and I'm going into my fifth year so my fourth year of coaching at this level was the first year I didn't play with a teammate or like coach with having played with somebody and as they got older and became leaders, it became more and more like difficult and enjoyable. It was really fun to watch like a freshman that you got to like be a leader for and a mentor for like figure out who they are as a leader and like lead a team That's to cool. high success. So there's a lot of just friendship that was still there. That was hard to like kind of have an authority over more than a peer leadership over. And it definitely took its toll emotionally and mentally, but physically being there and getting to watch great volleyball and get to like help great volleyball come to life is always going to be a, a bonus. But the biggest themes that I've taken away in my time so far as a coach is you go from 
getting to be selfish, even though you are a team player and want to do what's best for the team, but you are asked to become great as good as you can become. So you're asked to get the reps. You're asked to like do the work. You're, you're, the attention is on you as a player. And then you flip that as a coach and it's like completely selfless. Like you are just giving that to the players. And so I didn't realize that probably my first year I was like, I had a harder time with being selfless. And I would like to think I would aim to be a selfless person in general, but you still get attention as a player that as a coach, you're providing that attention. And that was like an interesting kind of transition. And now that I've been in it for a while, it's really fun to be selfless. It's really fun to give back to the sport that's given so much to me. And it's allowed me to figure out like how to make each player as good as they can become because I want to and like get to versus the have to that you were kind of asked to as an athlete. So it's kind of, that would be the biggest thing I would think. I remember (laughs) Brandon, my partner out here, he did that same transition where all of his best friends, you know, all of the parties and hangouts that, that we went to previously. Now you cannot go. So it's like, there's this like, cut off now between you and all of your best friends and you have to respect it as a coach you know you have to live by that yeah sometimes it turns into like you know i don't see that and sometimes yeah. you're putting this program in trouble and you can't do that because now it's my livelihood as well and yeah we made a few crazy calls when we were on the team but like i know all the calls that you're about to make and you can't do that anymore <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah no that that was fun. And I, that was hard to deal with, but I also got to embrace a different type of relationship that I'll never get to have again. Mm -hmm. So I could still be that leader that I could be a leader to the leaders that I didn't even get as a leader of like, Hey, when I was in your shoes at this point, like, I know what you're heading into and I know what you're trying to do. Like, this is how I think you could go about it. Like not allow them to avoid what I wish I would have avoided, but be there like for them, just like they were when they were freshmen. And I'm kind of speaking more to like when the last group that I got to coach like left and was done or in their last years. But that was, yeah, not being able to go to a movie or a dinner with people that you would yours was messed up. But. It's hard. I bet some people go through that like later on in, in their job jobs where they're like, they're in the mix and now they become like a C-level exec and all of a sudden there's a different weird barrier. And now that shifts, it's not an easy time in life when you upgrade, but everybody else has stayed at the same level. Not necessarily like you're a higher human yeah. than them, mm-hmm. but in your role, your position. And then sometimes your friend and social circle actually does have to change and you have to figure out how to navigate that as a human. Yeah. That's a really good point. (laughs) So then what are you guys currently working on for your players and what skill or asset are you currently improving as a coach? I could probably speak to the first one because I think that'd be unfortunately illegal. I should probably just write a blog and maybe that would suffice. But as a coach, I am wanting to improve my knowledge of the beach game. I mean, I came in as a sophomore, like into this game and Mm. I've been five years old when I started indoor. So like, there's just been years upon years of knowledge that I've gained. And I think that I'm still scratching the surface on like what I can learn to coach our team. And I feel like that's the most recent thing that you've learned that like popped your knowledge where you're like, Oh, yeah, that's great. I got a, a little tip from me today. Like one of the coaches that I hired, he works for me, but I have him coach me as well because he can give tips. And I was missing serves wide. And he's like, hmm. your torso can stay middle and your wrist can turn, but you can't have torso can't and wrist because you're going to miss everything out. And then as soon as he gave me that, like, I know that, but I wasn't doing it. So as soon as he gave me that, boom, all of a sudden my serve location got better. And I was like, thank you. You know, there's stuff that that we know sometimes that it's like, you just need somebody to tell you in the moment, but had there been any light bulbs for you where you're like, this is a great solution. Yeah. I think like learning how to properly miss like with the wind. Hmm. So like if the wind's like a strong crosswind and you're hitting a shot with the wind, not missing like a certain way, like if it's a high line shot, like not missing wide with the wind. So my like shot, like that I'm going to aim for is maybe more like five feet inside so that if it were to like blow, then it actually might go like to the proper spot. That's huge for a lot of people. Or 
vice versa. If it's against the wind, then I'm going to like be able to, if I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss sideline or wide and see like how far I can like miss. That yeah, ch changing where you imagine it's going to land based on the wind. That's huge. I see people miss all the time because they aim for the sideline or they think they have to get their cut shot all the way to the sideline. And mm -hmm. I'm like, listen, if you land your cut shot four feet from the net and four feet from the sideline, then your misses will be like the nastiest shot you've ever had in your life, which is cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, your good ones will still be a kill and your bad ones will be in play at least, mm -hmm. you know, sure. so, but when people aim for that sideline and then you take it, like you said, take into the account, the variable of wind, that's gonna, that'll change things bad. And people will just make errors. For sure. Hmm. All right. And that was something that you didn't pick up on or like light bulb during while you were playing. No, not at all. I would just go for the shot. <laughs> see yeah. If it landed. <laughs> Hell yeah. Just hit the open just sand. Just hit it away. Swing away, Meryl. <laughs> And is there anything that players do across the board where you see adult players, you know, B, A level, double A, that you think most people are making mistakes on or not doing it right? I don't know yeah. why. This is a pet peeve. Like Ooh, the I love biggest pet, pet peeve is when you're standing on like the in line and are like standing at the very edge of like, I guess, the corner and you're serving, whether it's into the wind or line side cross court. Like, I know it's so specific, but if, like, kids are standing, like, with their dominant hand to the cross court, like, across the court, and they toss to the opposite side of their body because they're trying to toss in that direction and the miss in the middle of the net, I get angry. Oh, so if I'm on, like, the right side of the court and I'm a right-handed player and, and I want to serve there. diagonal, yes, it's bad if they toss and they lead themselves into the diagonal. Yeah, and then they still, like, serve – as if they tossed well and would have a higher contact and it just murders the net. Huh. And I'm like, fix your toss. <laughs> Do you make them toss? Would you say the solution is to toss to the, to your right side and then change your hand angle? Or would it be to just turn your body and then have the same toss you always do, you know, so that your body just kind of gives it away. I'd say, make sure you toss to the right side. Okay. okay Cause so in, even that. if Ooh, I turn, yeah. like it's still a sharper angle to like hit the zone. But if I actually get it to my right arm, then I can still use my body and still finish the way I need to finish to actually like accurately hit the target. Mm. All right. You heard it. Everybody stop tossing to your non-dominant arm, <laughs> please <laughs> but <laughs> miss way. I mean, if you're going to miss in one spot, miss way outside on your dominant arm. You'll yeah. always be in a better spot there. Yeah. We get this like West coast wind in California. And if the wind's blowing off of the ocean and the winds on your, like coming from your right arm, mm. people toss like they normally toss. And then the wind tugs it to their left okay, ear fair, and then fair. they just bury it into the net, just like you're talking about. Yep. So when you feel that wind on your right side, I tell people, chuck it way right outside your body. I'm fine. If you chase the ball to the yep. right and then you need to cross body to come back, but at least you'll be high yeah. when you do that. Cool pet peeve, bad serve tossing. <laughs> it's weird. It's the weird and I can like handle mistakes, but I'm like, just mistake differently. <laughs> <laughs> Please learn differently. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Anything that the world should know about as far as the future of LSU beach volleyball, what your guys' goals are, what are you going for this year or anything new on the horizon? It'd be hard to not want to go for a national championship and be in the mix every single year for that and conference championship. If those aren't some of our goals, then I think we're, we're doing it wrong. But at the end of the day, like we want to do what we're supposed to do and be who we're supposed to be and then allow fulfillment to come from that place and trust to come from that place and at the end of the day just enjoy who we get to be around and what we get to do sounds like you guys are developing a fantastic culture and i think that culture always breeds good people and good athletes and attracts mm -hmm. the right people to the program so salute you for that that's big yeah. instead of x's and o's you know creating that personal culture is everything in terms of enjoyment and success across all facets of life i think sure all right kate I know you got a call. Uh, I know I, I held you late, so I really appreciate your time. And Thanks for uh, having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good luck next season. Thank you. Do you care if I pray for you in this? I know? would love for you to pray for me. Okay. Awesome. I'm just <laughs> going to do that, and then we'll say goodbye. <laughs> absolutely. Let's do it.
Okay, Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to Mark and just be a part of a really cool endeavor that he's going after. Uh, we just lift up this time to you and better at beach to you and just ask for your blessing and your favor um, that people would come to know you through this avenue, that Mark would continue to grow and who you have him to be for not only this, what he's going for here, but with his family and his wife, uh, would you heal his foot and teach him what you want to teach him through this time. And Holy Spirit, would you just allow him to experience all the fruits of the Spirit while he continues to become who he's supposed to be. But we love you, Lord, and we thank you for uh, sending your son to die on the cross for us to just have a better life and to have maybe not an easier life or um, less storms, but somebody to go through them with and have peace in the moment with. So we love you, Lord, and we thank you for this opportunity. It's in your son's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thank and thank you. you for having me. Absolutely. All right, Kate, we will see you on the sand. Enjoy your call. Go thank get to you. work. Have a great season. All blessings and prayers and, and good thoughts to you as well. Thank um, you so much. Amazing having you. Nice meeting you. You too. See ya. Bye. Bye. Cool show from a assistant coach. I mean, Louisiana State University, I mean, does it get higher level than that coming off of uh, NUS and, and cloth? If you guys know the AVP, the girls who are dominating right now at the age of like 22, 23, that program's now storied and they're heading in the right direction. And it sounds like culture is huge for them as it usually should be for champion championship teams. So loved having that talk, loved having her, her pet peeve of the <laughs> toss into the non-dominant side. And I went through that today and served a couple into the net and she's exactly right. Toss to your dominant side. As far as announcements from us guys, uh, currently, if you're watching this live, we are releasing our camp registration. So we're going to St. Pete beach in Florida. We have five weeks scheduled, but we know from experience that these are going to sell out and they sell out fast. So if you are not on our email list, you need to get on it because we do a tiered release, which means that the members of our complete player program, our online members, they get first crack at our camps. We keep our numbers, our coach to athlete numbers really small. And that's why we have to keep our player availability limited, right? So there's limited spots because we need excellent coaches there and we need a lot of coaches for the amount of players that we have. So we have only a certain amount of spots and you guys have to be on it if you want to get your spot. Our members get the email first. They get the chance at first booking. Then our email list members, after a few hours, they get their chance before we release it to the rest of the world on our website at better at beach forward slash camps. And of course, to social media. So if you follow us on Facebook or Instagram, better at beach volleyball, and TikTok, we actually have a TikTok account if you want to go and head there. All of those dates are being released in the next five weeks. This is in June, and uh, one by one, each of those camps will be released soon. And there is early bird pricing, so if you want to save some money and book ahead of schedule and reserve your spot, definitely, definitely, definitely make sure you are on our email list. If you go to betteratbeach.com forward slash camps, there's an easy form to fill out there. You can get on the email list. And just for signing up for our email list, you get 36 essential drills for beach volleyball. We have a little ebook for you. So if you need some beach volleyball drills, you can head on over there and grab that drill book and get on our email list so you know what we're doing. If you're watching this and you enjoyed all of the coaching, if you're a player or a coach and you are interested in getting practice plans, beach volleyball practice plans. We have them written out and we have them on video. Okay. So if you just want to know what you should be doing and drills that professional teams are doing and how they lay out their practices, we've already built that for you. We've got them all written out and videoed so that you can see the drill in action. And all you do is you download our app, take a look at your phone, say, that's the drill we're going to do. Let's emulate it, emulate it, imitate it, both of them. And then you're all set as far as your practice plan. So that's betteratbeach.com forward slash practice plans. And as usual, if you want to become a complete player, we have an incredible coaching program. And we are recruiting coaches apparently now from around the world who want to coach for Better at Beach. They're recognizing that we have positions for 
coaches on a essentially a commission basis. So we're adding to our staff. And what we do in the complete player program is you get all of the courses that we have. Every single one, serve, receive, setting, arm swing, mechanics, attacking, which is a lot of offensive design, decision-making, vision, everything like that. We also have a serving course, an ultimate defender course, and a blocking and peeling course, along with the practice plans and, of course, our 60-day max vertical workout program. All of those are included in the complete player program. And when you sign up, you go through one tutorial, and then in that tutorial, we tell you what drills you should do, and we give you modifications so you can do them on at home or on the court. And then it's your job, here's one of the bonuses, it's your job to film them. Then you post them on our private Facebook group, and that's where we can actively coach. So there is a ton of value in there because you have all of the courses that they do their job on their own. Even if we didn't coach you, you would know everything there is to know about passing, setting, offense, defense, etc. Then if you want to, you don't even have to upgrade. All you have to do is film your game, your practice, your technique, or even your squats and your hang cleans and everything because we have strength and conditioning coaches. And then you post them on the Facebook group and we go in and actively coach you. We've got a great staff that wants to help you with your game and help you guys get better. So if you're a coach and you want to join the team, please get in touch. And if you're a player and you want to get better, this is the way to do it. For you coaches who are new to the game and you want to add to your tool belt, I'm telling you right now that the Complete Player Program will make you a better coach. You will have more knowledge, more drill ideas, and uh, you will be more efficient as far as a coach, plus all the ideas that you can get and generate. So whether you're a player or a coach, the Complete Player Program is a great answer if you're looking to upgrade your knowledge and definitely your skills. Okay, you can check that out at betteratbeach.com, the page that actually explains a lot about that. If you need to, <laughs> to hear it or read it explained again, is betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching. And you can check all of that out on our website. I don't think I missed anything, but if you want to support us and you want to get some cool swag, you can head over to betteratbeach.com forward slash shop and you can check out our staff picks, everything that our staff loves bringing to the beach or having in our beach volleyball arsenal. We come out with three new staff picks every week in different categories and you can select from there and then we get a little affiliate bonus from those companies, but they're all things that we use and that we love. So head over to betteratbeach.com forward slash shop if you wanna check out our staff picks. I don't think I've missed anything. So editors, have fun with this, with my freezes and pauses. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening to a great conversation. If you wanna jump in a camp or clinic, you know where to find us. And if you have any ideas of who we should interview and what types of questions we should ask, please send those. If you think that we need more structure and less conversation, or if there are certain things you wanna know from certain people, let me know so that we can make this podcast more effective, better, more enjoyable for you. All right. That's it, everybody. This is Mark Burick signing off. I will see you on the sand.